Life Happens is the podcast brought to you by 87%, the innovative digital platform that uses clinically designed assessments to make mental health tangible, allowing businesses and individuals to measure, understand, and improve their mental well-being. Hi, everyone. I'm James Gwinnett, endurance athlete and marketing director of 87%. And in this series, I have the highly enviable job of speaking to inspirational people from the worlds of adventure, business, intelligence, sports, the military, and more to get their take on life's ups and downs, the setbacks that they've overcome, and how they've dealt with failure to get to where they are at the pinnacle of their sectors, all with the aim of helping you build positive mental health. This week's guest comes to us via our friends at motivational speaker agency, Speaker Buzz. I can't recommend these guys highly enough if you're looking for some of the world's most inspiring individuals to talk about the important topics, issues, and challenges we're facing. Check out speakerbuzz.co.uk for their, their full roster of incredible speakers, uh, of, of which our, our guest today is, is no exception. Uh, wow. After, after completing her uh, MA in international relations at the University of Chicago, she forged a career in intelligence working for the CIA, during which time she briefed US presidents, no less, uh, and advised the commanding general of, of uh, U- US and NATO forces on war zone strategy. Since leaving the agency, she's completed an MBA, become a successful entrepreneur, and is a business mentor through her brand, Entrepreneura. Uh, It is an absolute privilege and a delight to welcome to the podcast, Rupal Patel. How are you? Great, James. Thank you for that. It's lovely to be here with you. That's uh, it's very kind of you to uh, to 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 spend the time. Um, And the the first question: we we are a mental health platform, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Is is how are you? Good. Yes, very good. As we were talking about a bit offline, um, I am the mother of two. So my daughter is turning four today. um, And we also have a four month old. And so I'm in a really uh, buoyant mood in particular, because seeing how excited she is about her birthday has really just sort of got me really excited about, you know, life and the small things like birthdays and cakes and, and all that good stuff. So yeah, doing very well today. Thank you. Excellent. It's nice to be able to focus on something like that when when we're we're, we're locked down and when perhaps sort of isolated from our loved ones. But having that 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 kind of thing to focus on perhaps re well refocuses our attention and, and yeah. highlights what's important in in our lives. Definitely, and it's, it's interesting because I I do a lot of writing, and one of the things that I wrote over the weekend is just a short little article about. What are the things, some of the things I'm actually going to miss about lockdown? Because I know, you know, so much of this past year has been about lack or loss or missing out or not being able to. But actually, for me, and I imagine for a lot of other people as well, we've also been given quite a lot. And probably one of the biggest things we've all been given is just a pause from the frantic pace of life, you know? And I am not going to miss when things like open back up again the constant pressure to be everywhere, see everything, do everything, meet in person for this, that, and the other, all of the social engagements. You know, I've missed some of it, but I think before, you know, sort of in the normal times, I was just running around probably a lot more than I needed to. Um, And it's been so nice to have this time to just have time, you know, and to be at home a bit more, again, sometimes more than I would have liked. Uh, but I am going to miss this slower pace of life when when things go back to normal. I think it'll be interesting, actually, to see how we, as a society, but also mm. as individuals, how we transition back into that, yeah. and use the word normal in inverted commas, because I yeah. think there might be a slight sense of, sort of slight case of anxiety, perhaps, with yeah. some people, because we're going, we've gone from normal into a a period of huge change Mm -hmm. and now we're going back through another period of change into into what we used to know but it's difficult again going from one to the other to to different different situations like that yeah definitely and I think one of the things that I've started to do is because thankfully at least here in the UK we've got a plan right the PM has told us when things are going to start to open up so we can to some extent, foresee what our lives are going to look like and when different things are going to start being able to be doable again. Um, And so then we can plan how we're going to adapt to it and adjust to it in advance. And so, like I said, for myself, you know, I'm a very, very sociable person, but I'm also a homebody at heart. And I have loved not having to go out um, as much as I did before. So I've planned now, I've created, you know, a at least theoretically, a limit to how many social engagements I will go out to every month, how many times I'll travel for, you know, work or meetings or whatever every month. So that way, at least I've created some boundaries, some parameters that allow me to transition back into the normal 
in a way that just feels better and not running back to the way things were before just because we can. Yeah, sure. And I think it's important to keep <laughs> a, keep perspective and, and mm-hmm. keep in mind what's important and, yeah. and actually whether it be you know time at home with the family rather than being a social butterfly and going out yeah. every, every night or every weekend, actually spending some time focusing on your yourself, which this mm. this pandemic for you know for all the bad things that come with it has given us that that opportunity and that yeah. time for sort of self reflection yeah. um, is is very important. But let, let's let's come on to your 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 career. I, I hardly did it justice in my uh, in my my introduction. So so yeah. tell me, you went from the, the University of Chicago to, to working for the CIA. How? Yeah. I mean, how did that come about? What what a career path! What <laughs> what brought you into that? What compelled you to pursue it? Yeah. So I actually never thought I would work at the agency. It wasn't even on my radar. Um, I thought I was going to follow the Foreign Service track. So the U.S. equivalent of the Foreign Office is called the State Department. And while I was at university in undergrad. I did an internship for the State Department at our embassy in Muscat, Oman. And I just fell in love with the life of the expat. I fell in love with diplomatic work, with you know, engaging in political issues in a variety of different contexts of you know, being able to forge a career that was really about being overseas and engaging with the world on a broader scale. Um, so I always thought that that was gonna be where I went. It was gonna be straight to the State Department. But then after, you know, while I was at UChicago, I got recruited to the agency and you know, they liked that I had language skills. They liked that I had um, certain sort of international um, experience and also the fact that I had uh, some you know, awareness of international affairs and, and was getting a degree in international affairs. Um, and so I just thought, wow, okay, Okay, well, this wasn't part of the, the plan, as it were, but how do you say no to that, right? So obviously I did some sort of digging into what it would entail and what my life would potentially look like if I you know, chose to go down that career path. And it just seemed like, you know, why not? It was such a great opportunity. It sounded really exciting. And what, you know, I have my life philosophy is never say no to an adventure. And, you know, that adventure, when someone recruits you to have an adventure like that, you sort of, it's hard to say no to. Of course. I mean, it's, it just sort of seems very, very cool thing to be able yeah. to do. I worked there like, you know, you're a spy or, or something like that. It's, yeah. uh, but, 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 but then on the flip side, is it, was it quite a masculine alpha male environment? Yeah. You're surrounded by presidents, generals, lots of power, <laughs> yeah. probably a lot of testosterone as well. well. Lots of testosterone, yes. Even for an alpha female like myself, um, more often than not, I was the only woman in the room. I was o- the only person of color in the room. I was usually younger than most people in the room by at least 20 years. I mean, there were so many different facets of my identity and, and sort of who I am that just was outside of the norm of that working environment. Um, And it definitely wasn't without its sort of challenges, obviously, having to prove yourself, you know, being young and capable, and then having to go brief generals and, and, you know, senators and things like that, who were like, who's this 20 something year old? And why should I bother listening to you? You, I had to develop a lot of, you know, sort of, it sounds a bit uh, cliche, but things around resilience, mental toughness, self-belief, all of these things. But all of that was always, for me, very, very underpinned by expertise, because my position was, they can't dismiss me if I know what I'm talking about. You know, I need to be the expert in the room. And if they are bringing me into this room, then I'm going to be well prepared. I'm not going to give them any excuse to to dismiss me or to take me, you know, take me lightly. And so it was that combination of, you know, sort of working within the environment I was in, but also making sure I did everything I could to make myself as strong a possible sort of participant in those conversations as pos- as I could. So my next, you, you've sort of answered, my next question was on, on, on that note was how you overcame that, that situation. But I mean, was it, was it a combination of you had the, the innate sort of confidence in yourself to be able to mm-hmm. deliver the, the, the presentations and you, know, you knew that you'd done the, you know, the research and mm-hmm. had the expertise as, uh, as well? Or did you have to teach that to yourself? Um, I how, think, you know, what's the process, what's the process there? Yeah, so I think again, for me, developing expertise creates its own confidence. You know, if you really know your stuff, then you're going to be more often than not, or at least again for myself, just confident in delivering it. And so is the the delivery was never the issue. I'm, I'm very comfortable in front of big and small audiences, you know, and again, through the agency, I had to sort of adapt the way I shared the same information 
you know, to when I'm pitching it or speaking about it to, you know, presidents, high level decision makers down to the very tactical units and the special, the special forces that I worked with as well. So I was used to adapting and my message, the way I delivered it, sort of my tone, my body language, all of that kind of stuff, because partly because I, I think I am just a very intuitive person and I'm a very empathetic person. So I was able to use those skills in a in a much more um, concrete way than I had, you know, previously in my life. So I think some of it was, you know, things that I am inborn with, I guess, or developed over time. But some of that confidence was also because I had a great team that had my back. And, you know, I was never operating in isolation. Anything that I did was <clears throat> usually just one part of what our group did as a whole. And then I was the one delivering it. So it was never like I was just operating on my own. And that having, you know, like I said, having a team that's got your back, that helped me with any confidence issues that I might have otherwise had. Because if anyone questioned me, I knew that, you know, there were dozens and dozens more people behind me up to, you know, my, my supervisors and a few levels up who would totally back me totally support me and it was a le a relatively low risk way then of 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 putting myself out there because i we knew our we knew our stuff and i knew the, there were folks behind me so you know that the combination of those two things it just made it a lot easier so no know, knowing your stuff as you say i mean obviously you had the confidence in, in the research and the, the backing of your superiors and team which was excellent did do you do you think in which case that um allowed your character you you meant you talk about yourself as being an alpha female mm -hmm. did that allow your character to to thrive or yeah. did you have to sort of adapt to to the situation and perhaps mm -hmm. change your your character slightly and you know the, the resilience <laughs> and towards you in a sort of different way do, do you see what i mean yeah i do um i think it was a bit of both so <clears throat> i think like i said that confidence, that backing, it allowed me to be more of myself and more naturally, you know, it, it, I think in many ways, it was a natural fit, me doing the job that I did for for the for the agency um so definitely i felt that i could be more myself when there were times when i didn't when i felt a little bit just sort of uncertain or you know out of my not out of my depth but just sort of in a totally new environment where i hadn't proven to myself yet what i was capable of it was that part of part of what helped me was some of the the way I refer to it is, is conscious ignorance or tactical ignorance. So not, not sort of delving into the politics of the people I'm meeting, not like read, you know, with generals, for example, I know so many people who see the stars on their, on their pilots and they're just totally overwhelmed and, and freaked out by that. For me, I was like, you know what, I'm going to be very, very tactically and very consciously ignorant about certain things so that I don't psych myself up so that I don't get totally freaked out by this, you know, general or that senator or this person, because we have such a strange um, way of creating hierarchies in our heads. And my position has always been, and again, thankfully, the agency, to some extent, to a large extent, anyway, is a pretty flat organization. But you know, I, I do think that we all are equal and, and it takes a lot to internalize that. But I, I also helped myself internalize that by not studying so deeply the people and giving myself reasons to be afraid of them or intimidated by them or feel inferior in any way, because then I could just focus on being the best at what I was there to do, which was deliver a message, to engage on some policy work, whatever it was, and not get distracted by all of that other stuff. Sure, and that, that that's very interesting because we do put a, a huge emphasis as you know, as a society and individuals on that sort of hierarchy, don't we? And mm. we were, we were discussing in the build up to, to to chatting that the idea of you know labels and identity, yeah. self worth, and 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 purpose in life, and you yeah. know that, that concept of success. Now, does a an individual with you know stars on his on his epaulette and his shoulder yeah. does, that, does that denote success? And it's very interesting on. You know, how, again, it's a matter of perception as to how you perceive success. Yeah. What would you say to listeners who, who are, I don't know, perhaps striving for success in, in their field or haven't mm. yet found what their definition of success might be? I have two things, actually. One is a fantastic quote. I think it's from Maya Angelou, where, um, and maybe you and I talked about this before, but the definition of success is liking who you are, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. And I think that's such a simple, but also very profound way of thinking about success because 
liking who you are. I mean, for some, for some of us, I, I put myself in that category as well. It's a lifelong process and, and it takes a lot of um, internal introspection. It takes time. It takes, uh, you know, getting, letting go of baggage that we accumulate over time and through experiences and relationships and just to finally getting to the core of who we are and who we are that, that we're proud of. So that liking yourself, then liking what you do, this ties into sort of the second answer is my approach has always been to experiment is to take life seriously, but to take it lightly. So I have never really had a, you know, a, a life sort of plan that, you know, I'm going to do this and then this and then this and then this. I had sort of fairly short term plans, maybe three to four years in, in ahead, because I think we all do need to plan and there's a lot to be said for it. But I also didn't want to be so tied to a plan that I was blinded to all of the other opportunities that might come my way, the, the chances to prove to myself things that I didn't know were possible to, again, to tap into uh, aspects of who I am that I didn't even know were there. So I wanted to very, again, very consciously create an environment where I could be flexible, you know, sort of my operating principle is always to just make the best of the chances you've got in front of you. And yes, again, plan a bit, you know, in advance to the extent that that's realistic and, and, and doable. But you know, I, I wanted to have a bit of a flexible, agile career as it was and an approach to life because I think the experimenting is fun and, and learning what you like to do and how and liking how you do it is, is a huge experiment. And again, it's taking it seriously, but also taking it lightly, not letting labels define us, titles define us, where we work define us. And or if we let it define us, then let it define just a small part of who we are and not everything so that we can then change who that person is and change industries or change roles roles or titles, whatever, without it being a total, um, a total knock to, to our sense of self and our sense of identity. So, you know, again, that idea around success, I think it does take a lot of experimentation because sometimes you don't realize what you like until you realize all the things you don't like. It's sort of like dating, right? <laughs> and, then, and finding a partner. Um, and then secondly, it's, yeah, again, that bigger picture idea of liking who you are, working towards finding who that person is, and then liking what you do and how you do it. <laughs> Excuse me. That um, allows me to sort of neatly crowbar in the um, the eighty seven percent app. Yeah. You know, talk about liking yourself and understanding yourself. Uh, the app allows users, as we mentioned, to to measure their their well being and understand mm. different areas in which uh, they're able to make Im improvements. I loved your feedback on on the yeah. app because yeah. um, for a bit of feedback, you you, fi you fill out a, a number of assessments and get uh, a, a mental fitness score across different dimensions of life. And, and you get a score out of 100. And you found yourself frustrated that you, you did <laughs> a, a perfect score. And I mean, I, th I think that's absolutely fascinating because you know, know. it's impossible to be perfectly mentally uh -huh. fit, much like it is, you know, everyone can always be slightly physically fitter. It's exactly yeah. the same for mental fitness so so tell me what went through your mind if you didn't have 100 out of 100 in your, your mental fitness score so a bit of context I have always been a nerd and and that kid in school who would leap out of my chair to answer the question that the teacher had just asked I have and you know I'm good at school I'm good you know I've literally had straight A's my entire life and like sort of academic performance and measurement in sort of numerical ways has sort of been something that I've just, again, internalized over time. I also come from a family where success was just ex expected of us. So for example, and, and not just success, but uh, academic excellence. So if I ever got a 95% out of 100, the, the response, and it sounds a bit cliche, again, amongst a lot of immigrant and sort of um, Asian or Indian and background families, but the response wasn't, oh, well, that, well done. It was, oh, well, what happened to those other five points? You know, why, why, why did you mess up, mess up on that? And, and that's something that, you know, I, I sort of laugh it off and I, it, it was never, I never felt a, it, a, to be a burden. You know, I liked the fact that my parents set a really high bar for us because I think also more often than not, people rise to expectations as well as sort of will fall to expectations. So what, if you're going to have expectations of somebody, make them, you know, high without making them burdensome. Um, but so numbers have always <laughs> mattered to me. And so when I was filling out the app and getting these scores and I was like, what? I got an 80% in that? That's not right. And then I was having this ridiculous it's conversation. Really <laughs> it was so ridiculous, James. I was having a conversation like, hmm, maybe I should take it again and see if I can get a better score. <laughs> maybe I can, you know, find a way to hack it somehow so that I get a score that I feel is truly reflective of who I am. Um, but it was, it was just this funny thing where I, you know, obviously I'm laughing about it because as you said, 
the aim isn't perfection and the aim and, and, and there's always room for improvement. And I, I definitely have, that's something that's really important in my life is this idea around constantly growing, constantly learning all of these kinds of things, but it taught up just sort of whiplash me right back into being that school age kid where I was like, oh, you mean I only got an 80% this, like, I can't, you know, it was this weird time warp thing where I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not an 80% student. I'm a 100% student. So this app must be wrong. That's hilarious. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, let's let's perhaps flip it. I mean, you yeah. know, feel free to 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 say no, if, uh, if this is too personal. But were, were there any areas within the app that that jumped out as that might perhaps need improving that, that you might be looking at as uh, as you know, working on in the in the coming coming days or weeks if you if you continue to use it? I don't think it was anything with the app. I think some of it is also when I take any type of questionnaire, my brain is always on hyperdrive. That's, you know, sort of a blessing and a curse. I'm a very analytical person. I am very, I love to dissect things. I love to analyze, sometimes overanalyze. And so there are a couple of questions where I was like, well, technically speaking, it would be like this, but the reality is this. And so I, you know, sort of tried to answer as honestly as possible. But there was one part where something along the lines of like, saying no to people or no to requests for help. I can't remember the specifics. And then the score I got in that in that little sort of subcategory was 80 something percent. And I was like, I wonder if it was that question because the way I had interpreted, the way I, again, my sort of philosophy of life is, is we have to be very careful and selective with our yeses and very profuse with our noes insofar as creating boundaries, making sure we're not being um, constantly like external and never saving anything for ourselves and blah, 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 blah. So I think it was my rating on like compassion or community or something that was a bit low, but I was like, but that's not true. I am a very compassionate person. I just don't want to constantly be giving. I also want to make sure I have some room for myself and keep something for myself. So coming on to asking, uh, asking for help from other people. <laughs> yeah. Let's, I mean, let, let's swing back to your career ever, ever, ever so quickly. If, if yeah. we know, because life happens. The, the podcast is about helping people overcome challenges that, that yeah. life, life throws at us. So you, are you able to think of an example in your career or, or life uh, of, a, uh, of a setback, um, perhaps how it affected you and, and perhaps the, the need to, to ask others for help? Oh, that's a good one. Um, do you know, I think I'm always asking for help, actually. Um, I can't, hmm. I'm trying to think. If obviously sort of, working for the CIA and advising <laughs> yes. presidents, you have to get it right. Well, I will say, okay. Time. But uh, was there, a, is, I mean, there, the question is, was there a, in inverted commas, a, a failure that you, yeah. that you learned yeah, yeah, yeah. from, that you overcame? Yes. So yes, definitely. And this is sort of where I was starting to, to go with. I remember when I first started again, eager beaver, so, so keen, so wanting to like make my mark and impress everybody, all of this kind of stuff. And a lot of what my work entailed, especially in the early days before I was doing anything in the field was writing. It was written analysis, taking in reams of information, writing, and, you know, again, distilling it in a way that's usable, actionable, and, and helpful. And uh, I remember the first probably first two or three things that I was tasked to write totally independently, I cocked up so majorly. And the way it works is there's a long review process. People at various stages will look over what you've said to check over not just the analysis and the quality of the analysis, but also factual correctness and, and style as well and all these other things. And I, again, sort of, like I said, I'm an A-star student. And so when I got my initial drafts back and they were just bloody red with X's and marks and comments and all this stuff, I was like, oh my God, did I pick a totally wrong career? I consider myself a pretty good writer as well. So I was like, how did I screw this up so badly? And what I loved about that environment and what this, the life skill I took away from it is one, it was done sometimes with more compassion, sometimes with less, but always, always, always with the intent of making me better. And that's, again, coming back to this idea around improvement and always having room for improvement. It doesn't matter if you're Hemingway, you can still write a better book kind of thing. And that's what I loved. So it was, again, sometimes judgmental, sometimes less judgmental, but more often than not, the default position was, this needs work, 
we're not criticizing you. We're not saying you suck. We're saying this sucks and you can do better. And I liked that idea that people, again, held me to a really high standard, a higher standard than, than I, you know, than I sort of had, had for myself at the time. And I, and, and that was something I started to internalize. And again, with anything that's a, considered a failure or a setback or a challenge or negative feedback, what then it started to mean for me was just an opportunity. And this is going to sound perhaps a little bit too, too easy, but it's, it to me is an opportunity to improve. It's an opportunity to actually test myself and prove to myself that actually, yeah, I can do better. And again, very few things in life are perfectly formed from the outset. And that being in that environment where it was, again, this idea of fail fast, fail often, and then get it right. It was really, really important for me to develop that resilience to then not take it personally, you know, and to, to just view it as feedback. And what you make the feedback mean is totally up to you. But I started to take it as I can do better and I'm going to do better. How can I improve myself and how can I make the comments fewer next time? Or how can, you know, what can I work on in order to, to really get better at this craft? And so that was the failure. It was not being as amazing as I thought I was from the outset and getting some really strong feedback, but then starting with, you know, starting from that position over time, getting much more comfortable and actually even welcoming it. Like it got to the point where when it get to certain higher levels of review and they'd come back and say they had no comments, I'd be like, are you sure? Like, you sure you don't want to change anything? I mean, I, I, I started to feel uncomfortable with positive feedback too then, you know? So I think developing a thick skin was really, really important. And was that, that was for me how I did it. And I, I probably before then had never failed in anything in my life but having you know gone through that process so deeply for so many years it has developed really thick skin to the point where I don't take anything personally anymore or the times I do take things personally it's very very fast and then I'm able to bounce back you know pretty quickly I think I think that's a key firstly you said you know is it too easy to say I think absolutely not it it is an absolute life essential Mm. um, to be able to to take to um, accept failure and and yeah. that's a very key point what you've just said about taking it personally it's it's never personal mm-hmm. um and no matter what success looks like to you as an individual whether you're james dyson the, yeah. the you know the, the most the, the richest man in the uk who built five thousand prototypes of his vacuum before yeah. before actually work you know coming out with the correct one or whether you're michael jordan and you shot mm-hmm. a million free throws and missed them all before winning six six titles it it doesn't matter what success looks like for you the fact that you will fail and you will fail hundreds thousands millions of times before that that um concept of success you you reach that that concept is something that and the trouble is it's it's embarrassing we feel ashamed um it's a knock to our self-esteem but but as you say it's not personal and actually all failings should be seen as learnings yeah, definitely. And, and again, it gets back to this idea of what do we make it mean, right? Because feedback, failure, or setbacks, challenges, all of these things, they're not, they're not good or bad. They're just things. But we then put the meaning on them. We then make it mean that we're not destined to be a, a football or a you know, basketball star. We're not destined to be a great inventor or whatever it is. And it's our interpretation that's totally makes the difference between the James Dysons of the world and probably the thousands of other inventors who had, you know, potential prototypes that could have turned into something, but then, you know, sort of gave up after a few years or just getting frustrated. And it's that it's what do you make it mean? And and it is totally value, value neutral, the things that happen. It's what do you make it mean that will determine how you proceed from from that point onward? I've, I've just read a, uh, an interesting book, actually, and you're absolutely right. James Dyson was not the first person to come up with his technology <laughs> in his vacuum, but he was yeah. the first person to fail enough yeah. times to make it work. Yeah. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so, so moving on to what your, I mean, you left the, the CIA, what was it about 10 years ago now? Um, uh, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit more about what you've been doing since, since then. Yeah, so I knew when I left that uh, I wanted to just test myself in a different way. Like I said, I have this very experimental approach to life and in just seeing like, again, taking it somewhat lightly, but also seriously, like, 
hmm, what can I do next? What am I capable of? Where have I not tried to prove myself? And, and how can I, you know, see what, again, what I'm made of in a totally different context. And so after, after the agency, I went to business school because I thought, okay, well, I've, I've cut, I've proven to myself that I can, you know, sort of reach whatever personal and professional heights I want working at the agency. Let me go try and do that in the private sector. And one of the things that started to come to be very, very clear to me was that I didn't want to work for anybody else. And it was that idea of just wanting to be, because I'm also a very independent and independently minded person. And I just hated the idea of potentially having to work for someone who, to put it very bluntly, was stupider than I was or didn't have the same vision. And again, not to to put a value judgment on, on difference, but just what did I want to do that? And the answer for me was no. And so I, I sort of, I'm a creator in lots of ways. I never lack for ideas, came brainstormed a hundred of, you know, literally hundreds of different business ideas of what I could do to, when I launched out, if I launched out on my own. And so decided to start my own business and <clears throat> for lots of big and small and, reasons. And so, sorry to interrupt, but of yeah. those hundred ideas, I assume yeah. 99 of them were failures. And well, you, there, you, 99 you, of them actually, I didn't even try. Wrong. Well, I didn't try 99 of them. I, I was like, it was, it was, for me, sometimes, again, you have to get through all the garbage before you get to the goal. And there were some potential really good nuggets in there, but they never spoke to me long enough for me to actually want to commit to them. But the interesting thing is that uh, there was one idea that always stuck with me that it just it wouldn't go away. It just stayed with me. And it wasn't my first business. It was my second business. And so this comes back to this other idea that I think or another theme that has come up in my life many times and that I, you know, I often share with others is your next move doesn't have to be the last move. And again, this idea around experimentation, iteration, being open to things. Um, I think so many people make their current job or their next job be like, oh, well, it has to be the perfect fit. It has to be this. It has to be that. It has to be a launch pad for X or, or Y or whatever. It can just be a job. And while you're buying your time to do something else or find that other thing that you really, really care about. And so for me, the first idea and the first business that we started was by we, I mean, me and my, my now uh, husband um, is, is a real estate business. And I had no experience in real estate. I had absolutely no background or ex- whatever, but it was one of those things where again, through a very um, analytical process, um, we decided that this was a good, a good, good way to go. And I gave myself a time limit. I said, look, I'll work on it all guns blazing for the next 12 to 18 months. If I can make a success of it, great, we'll keep going with it. If not, I'm going to cut my losses and move on. And thankfully, it was it, we made a success of it. And then, you know, in the first 18 months, um, yeah, it was developing enough momentum where I was like, okay, we'll run with this. And then about five years into the business, we were doing well enough to where I was able to retire my partner now husband. Um, And that gave me much more flexibility again to then revisit this other idea for my second business, which throughout that first business and the growth of that and building of that, this other thing just never left me. And it was this idea of helping, of creating a community for for women leaders and leaders in any any definition of that term. It doesn't mean your job title, but, you know, you know, personal leadership as well, but helping them get out of their own way and and really tap into their potential. So we've talked about some of these ideas, you know, throughout this conversation so far, but so many people through experience, through relationships, through things that are told, we pick up, myself included, we pick up so much baggage about what we're capable of, what we should and shouldn't do, who we are, what is possible, what's impossible, how high we should try to reach, how small we should keep ourselves and all of these things. And I think, for so many different reasons, cultural, societal, you know, historical, whatever, women often grapple with them on a much more regular basis and use use these this baggage as a as as something that just defines and confines them and never allows them to really see what is what more they could achieve or do or 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 be. And so that was the idea that never really left me because again in all of these alpha environments first the agency and then in business school and then you know corporate environments and then in in construction and, and real estate I mean you know it's it's 
there were no women. And it wasn't for lack of interest or for lack of capability. There were so many internal and external things that happen. And I think a lot of the external stuff is being talked about more, more widely now, but the internal I think is the much more devastating. And that's what I wanted to start helping women unpack was the internal limitations we put on ourselves on our aspirations and just help them get out of their own way. So that's what Entrepreneur is all about. It's about, you know, helping the next generation and the current generation of women leaders in every definition of that word, just get out of their own way and really tap into what they're capable of and then start fulfilling that potential. Wonderful. It's such a lovely message. And there's various sort of things that jump out at me, that things like believing believing in your, your own capability and, yeah. and, and keeping your options open. And there's just so, so many important messages that... Uh, that, that come out of that story. So, uh, so thank you for uh, thank you yeah. for sharing. Um, I'd like to finish if it's uh, we have a, a quick. Uh, well, before is there anything else that you're you're working on that you want to to, to sort of highlight before we go? Yeah. Up a, a few quick fire questions at sure. the. At the, at the end is there anything else that we've haven't covered off that you you want to? Well, just wanted to share that I'm writing a book. So. Um... So the book is, again, a sort of a, a summary of a lot of the ideas, the life lessons, the, the sort of the self-belief, the resilience, the mindset, the toughness lessons, et cetera, that I've built and developed over my own life. Um, but basically, it's, it's all about the unconventional life lessons for thinking bigger, leading better, and being bolder. And the message is, is both to men and women. So I think, you know, again, men have these conversations with themselves as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm currently working on that book, and I'm hoping that it'll be out by the end of this year. So and where, do, where do people find more information uh, about, about where do they follow you on Instagram where do they find information about the book where, how do we yeah. get in touch the best place to start is just my website which is pretty straightforward it's rupalypatel.com that's it don't do Rupal Patel because she is a Indian actress who looks nothing like me <laughs> so it's rupalypatel.com <laughs> noted Rupal Y Patel not the yes. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll come on to a, a few uh, quick, quick fire uh, yeah. questions. Let's do it. Um, is there anything that is an absolute non-negotiable that you do regularly to help your mindset or improve your mood? Ooh. Yes, uh, it's again. I'm a, I'm a reader, so it's this book called The Miracle Morning, and in it he has this sort of morning routine that uh, that he recommends but it's um it's a silly acronym but it's um silence so meditation or just spending some time with yourself in in, in silence and, and quiet um a is affirmations so telling yourself the things you know affirming whatever is important to you uh visualization so physically you know closing your eyes and visualizing where you're going what you want to achieve the e stands for exercise which is very very important you know getting the blood flowing r is reading and then s is well, he calls it scribing, but basically writing or journaling. Um, but some form of that I have done for probably about three years now. And it really just sets the tone. I mean, the book, again, is a little bit kitschy, a little bit, you know, sort of out there, but just suspend disbelief. It's been brilliant. And it does genuinely help. So for anyone who's looking for a great, very easy read and some, some tips on a wonderful morning routine, that's what I do. And Savers is the uh, yes. yeah, very important. Yes. I'm a big fan of the exercise. Of, 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 I'm a big yes. fan of the E of that. So. <laughs> yes, you are. Perhaps need to do a few more of the others. But uh, yes. um, and what makes Rupal? What makes you good at what you do? I think it's two things. One, it's I think I've have a really strong, strong familial support network background. My mom in particular is just, again, this idea we talked about earlier about someone who has my back. This woman is probably one of the most powerful, sort of quietly powerful people I know. And just knowing that I am, I come from her has been a huge part of what drives me and also what wants me to help others and sort of play on a bigger stage. The second is I think I chose ridiculously well with my partner. We often don't think enough about who we choose to spend our lives with and what that's how that's going to affect our lives. We think, oh, well, you know, I like them or I love them or whatever it is, or they're good looking. Um, but actually, he has unlocked so many different parts of who I am. It, from, my, from my perspective, I think a great partner really helps you not just see the best in yourself, but bring that person out more often. And having him in my life has, I said it the other day, actually, it, was, it sounds a bit cheesy, but 
he helped me find my purpose. You know, the, he didn't do any of the work, but being in having him in my life, someone who is as supportive and as can do and as sort of growth mindset oriented as he is really, really helped me go on a similar sort of exploration internally to unlock the things that I'm truly passionate about. And, and again, un, and find my purpose. So it's those two things. It's the, the people in my life. I don't think that's cheesy at all. I think that's uh, very touching and it's very yeah. important to have people people around us. Yeah. Um, what would you say to a young Rupal? <laughs> I, um... apart, apart from don't worry about getting 80% on the 87% app. Apart from so this that. is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would tell her to go for 100% anyway, but um, no. It's sort of a, um, it's a very emotional uh sort of question. And, and, and the reason I find it really emotional is because I'm not who I was now back then. And I was very, very uh, self-conscious, very shy, very um, just doubted myself a lot. And so what I would say to her is, and, and I still have to remind myself to this day, to be honest, oftentimes is really just believe in yourself and don't ever, ever give up. And those two lessons, I kid you not, I remind myself on a daily basis. It's definitely a message I would, I wish I had, you know, sort of gotten from someone or from myself, you know, earlier in life, but believe and never give up. I think that sums up for, for so many people. And, but definitely for me, what, you know, the things that, yeah, I wish I knew earlier on. I think everyone could take, uh, take a slice of that. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's incredible. Very, very inspirational. And, and, and finally, any, any other ideas, places, things? You mentioned a book, um, yeah. places that, that you have taken inspiration from recently or, or, or over the years, anything that you're reading or seen recently? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, nothing really step, stands to mind. But one thing that keeps coming back to me again and again and again, because people often ask me, who is your role model? You know, who, who, do, you, who do you admire? And to be honest, James, there's not any one person that I like, put on a pedestal or, you know, think is like the pinnacle of X, Y, or Z. There are a lot of people who I think are great and who, you know, I see going through their own process of discovery, of, of, of change, of exploration, of experimentation, et cetera. And I'm like, good for them. I think one of the things that's come back to me again and again is we often look externally for role models and for, for people who can prove to us that something is can be done. I think it's really important, maybe more important, that we be role models for ourselves. And one of the things that has been so brilliant about being a parent or becoming a parent is that I know that in big and small ways, my kids are watching me. And it has forced me to then be the role model that I wish that I had for myself, but then also knowing that they're picking up stuff for me as well. So it's it's sort of a hard question to, to really sort of give a simple answer to. But I think sometimes we owe it to ourselves to be to be the role model we wish we had and prove to ourselves what we're capable of and what's possible. It's a, it's a deliberately very narrow question. So I, I love <laughs> the fact that you've basically flipped it. I'm not going to answer that, James. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I love that. No, yeah. that's, that's, that's beautiful. Really, really enlightening. Uh, listen, Rupal, it has been an absolute pleasure it has been enlightening inspirational you've taken us on an, an adventure uh can't wait to see the uh the, the book we'll definitely be getting a, a copy of that I'm sure the cool. um the listeners will be um be fascinated by the insights that come from that um and really appreciate your time it's been an absolute pleasure james i love talking about these things as you can tell so thank you for for giving me an opportunity to share my pleasure thank you again I'd love to say a big thank you to RuPaul for sharing her time and experiences with us. What a fascinating episode it was. RuPaul really has had a, a remarkable career, but it's her attitude towards difficult situations that particularly stood out for me, namely that they don't need to be daunting if you're sufficiently prepared to deal with them. We have a tendency to doubt ourselves, whereas we should all take something from the lesson of believing in our capabilities and expertise, no matter the circumstances. If you liked the podcast, please subscribe and share it and look out for the next episode of Life Happens coming soon.